With COVID-19 creating a pandemic globally, we are all at risk. But with the elderly and persons having underlying conditions, the risk is that much greater. Today we talk with CEO at GLOW's Adult Care Center, Dr. Patrice Charles, as she brings awareness and understanding to the issues related to COVID-19 and the elderly. Our center, GLOW's Adult Care Center, we have been around for 25 years. Um, my mom, who's a nurse practitioner that I started the company we started with one resident one patient and now we have kind of blossomed into having like 35 patients and we're a 60 bed facility so we have room to grow we have as young as um 50 and we have um we've gone all the way up to 101 so we have a range, but the average the average age of our, our residents is between 70 and 85. Dr. Charles was particularly concerned about the possible effects of COVID-19 on the staff and residents. I'm, I'm extremely concerned. As, as a public health consultant, um, we I, I ensured that we started right away in regards to putting in public health measures to protect not only the patients, but also the staff. So we created a, an area for the nurses to actually live in. So we created a new living space for them. And we put in some physical um, measures. So at the entrance, we put in a pedal sink, so you don't have to touch it. You can just press it for the water. We put in um, sanitizer, soap. So as soon as you come in, you wash your hands. And the nurses have a separate entrance from the front, so they will go around to the side and do the same thing, sanitize. We've asked all our nurses that have to travel, that can't stay in, not to travel in their scrubs and their uniforms. So they'll come in in plain clothes, go around the back to their quarters, bathe, change into their scrubs. Put on, um, they would, of course, have on their masks and gloves. They come in. They have to take their temperature before they get in so that we can, you know, see, make sure. And then they start. So the only individuals that are allowed in after sanitizing and of course meeting the requirements, um, which is we take everyone's temperature, are medical personnel and the physiotherapist. For a nursing home, having those kind of clients that are the most vulnerable, they're immune compromised, they, they have cardiac problems. A lot of our patients are hypertensive and diabetic. And so to be exposed to COVID-19 would literally be a death sentence. So it's something that we, we have to take seriously. The family members and guardians are quite appreciative of the measures that we've taken um, as strict as they are. And in regards to our nurses, if our nurses fall ill, and we, you know, it's, it's funny because We've kind of forgotten that there are other illnesses out there. There's a common cold and flu and sinusitis and allergies that present in the same way. And But if our nurses do happen to unfortunately fall ill, they cannot return to work without being um, seen by a medical doctor, either tested for COVID-19 or declared that they don't have the symptoms of COVID-19. The adjustments at the home were not easy to make. I think the hardest part was to arrange living quarters for the nurses. We had a space for the nurses to uh, to rest, um, if it needs be. But what we had to go ahead and do is literally create a living area and space for them. Um, that would have probably been the hardest part um, for the for our our family members. I think it was difficult for them to adjust, not being able to come and visit their loved ones. So what we've arranged is like video. Um, chats so they can do video calls and, and see how they're doing. Um, for some who just really need to see, we'll allow them to come and we'll, we'll take their family member to the front balcony so that they can see them and interact. But they can't come in and touch them. They have to still stay six feet apart and in a mask. You know, you, you just have to um, purchase the necessary sanitizers and PP. Um, personal um, protection equipment for the nurses. The nurses always had their gloves, so that's a necessity. 
but now we had to ensure that everyone had a mask and that they would go home in masks. And um, for those patients that are respiratory compromised, they were in full gown. We only had one patient like that who's no longer with us. He's at the hospital right now. But he always had a reoccurring pneumonia. Um, he wasn't exposed at the home, but we were just overly cautious. I think it's just better to be overly cautious. It's very important that the nurses have their hand sanitizers and masks. And, and so we have like four different distinct areas within the nursing home that we have um, set up sanitizing stations within the home. So if a, pa if a nurse comes out of a patient's room, there's, there's an area right there that she can use her hand sanitizer or wash her hands. Um, I think that was the biggest changes that we made to the home to ensure that every area of the home has easy access to um, sanitizing your hands. For, for those residents that have a cold, we put them in masks. Um, for guests that need to come and stay up front, um, we even ask that they, they put on a mask. For any medical personnel that's coming in, they have to put on a mask. But I'm a public health consultant. So um, it's, it's something that we, just in case, we've always had a just in case type of mentality. Um, an approach towards the nursing home as far as readiness for anything. We have monthly meetings with the nurses so they were aware of what to do in, in a time of crisis, in a time where we would have to take certain public health procedures. And I must say, I, I, I am blessed that we do have a staff that was able to come together as a team and look out for each other. So during the whole curfew, even though they're essential services, they were, you know, they would say, okay, you go home because you live far and you're not able to stay tonight. So, you know, so we were all, the floor is always covered. Um, and that goes for not just for the nurses, but for our three or four auxiliary staff members also stay over. Because somebody has to cook, somebody has to clean, somebody has to do laundry. And so they, they also um, stayed on um, resident too just so that they wouldn't be exposed. Dr. Charles notes that the staff, residents, and their families have concerns regarding the disease. How easy it is to, to get it, and how there are individuals that could be walking around that's asymptomatic, and you, you really don't know um, who has it. And, and so there's that, that insecurity because you're unsure as to the person standing beside you in, in the supermarket could have it and you don't know. Um, family members are concerned about their loved one being exposed because they're so vulnerable, of course. So they do understand. We sanitize, if they have to bring anything for them to the home, like diapers or, or um, toiletries, before we take it in, we sanitize them outside. We're concerned about any possible exposure right now. The unknown, the unknown, but what I also, encourage the, the nurses to do, and this is from the psychologist side of me, is to be aware of everything. Be informed, properly informed, be aware of what's going on, um, be aware of any clusters that's taking place right now and where you are living and what's going on in your community. And, you know, once you are aware, you can make that next right decision. If you are living in fear, of what's taking place, then you're going to start panicking, you're going to become anxious, and more than likely, you're going to be reacting to an emotion versus, you know, a reasoned, um, um, logical step. So I, I try to keep them calm, but, you know, sometimes they, they're not. Um, they're human, they're not robots. So, you know, meeting with them regularly and reassuring them that everything is okay and um, that if we just stick to the right public health procedures, more than likely we can get through this, you know, we'll get through this without anyone that's associated with the home um, being exposed to it. The home has also ensured that should a resident contract the illness, there is a designated quarantine area. We do have what we have designated our quarantine area in a completely separate building, but there, we are not even considering using that area. We are hoping that no one comes in to expose any patient so that we would have to move a patient or a nurse to that area. The center also has protocols for taking a resident to the hospital if they become ill. But I can tell you, you know, we actually have a, a patient that's, that was just recently sent to the hospital 
Um, before he came back, he had to be tested for COVID-19. It was negative. And when, even though he was tested negative, we still kept him separate for 14 days, just in case. You know, you just, you just don't know. So we still kept him separate for 14 days. Physically, mentally, emotionally, I'm okay because I keep aware. And again, I'm a public health consultant, so I, I know what I know what the what the environment is like, what the situation is like, and what needs to be done. There is nothing that you can do, so panicking is going to help. It's just to remain aware and to put in the necessary public health procedures to ensure that your patients and your staff is safe, which I have done financially. I think life is more important than, than the financial gain that I could have by still admitting patients. I think it's absolutely necessary to encourage our, our the elderly, our senior citizens, our parents and, and our grandparents to stay indoors if they can at this time. Um, because their, their age range, their age group has been deemed more vulnerable and susceptible to, to COVID-19. Um, or recovering from COVID-19. But it's not easy for them, you know, it's not easy for an active elderly mind to just stay confined indoors. I, like, again, my father is 83 um, and he's very active and it's, it's difficult for him to just stay inside, you know, stay in the house, even if he's walking around outside. He's, he's used to playing tennis five o'clock every morning. But what I do is, and I, I call him, I FaceTime him, I try to keep him occupied. Once in a while, I pass by, but even that is not even, you know, the best thing to do because you don't want to expose them to anything that you may have. And um, when I'm on the road, I walk with a box of masks, to be honest with you. And when I see senior citizens walking around without a mask, I say, hey, would you like a mask? And I give them a mask because it is, to me, it's at this point in time, during this pandemic, if, if we are not going to stick together and help each other, we're not going to be able to successfully make it through. And so I really believe that each one has to help one. And that's the best way to get through this. Because if this is not something that's just geared towards the elderly. Young people can get it. Young people can die from it. It's not just rich. It's not just poor. It's every single person on this planet right now, it's a pandemic, you know. Um, this is not the time to take advantage of someone to try and make an extra buck. This is a time where you actually, you know, help the most vulnerable, the help those that can't go to the supermarket and buy wholesale. At Glow's Adult Care Center, what my my nurses and my, my residents have shown me is that, that the best of us will come shining through. And so I'm hoping that people will look on us as a model and the other homes will, can, can look on us as a model to say, let's implement this and let's start right now. It's not too late to start. And what we do at the home is something that even in your individual personalized home, you can do, you know, to ensure that if, if you have a guest coming in, that they sanitize at the gate, you take your shoes off when you're coming from work. Um, you know, if you can have your laundry, I have my laundry right by my, inside my door now and I just strip and put everything in there sanitize right there and take off my shoes and put it on a rack outside you know so we just have to realize that life has changed and it may not go back to what we thought was normal and this is the new normal and you know it's, it's just something that has to be done we can't complain about it we just have to do it even if i am on the road and i see someone and they're wearing their mask incorrectly i, I would say something to them or i'll show them how to wear it correctly you know, if you hold on to your mask and you keep taking it on and off your face, you are literally infecting yourself by touching your face. You know, so sometimes I can show them how to remove the mask safely. And it's well received. I have not been insulted for helping anyone or to, for pointing out that your mask is on upside down. You need to be careful with that. Before you're going to touch your face or before you're going to put on your mask on your face. And let me just declare that I have sanitized prior to touching my face. I have my hand sanitizer right here on my desk, um, which I use regularly. But if you're gonna go out, if, if you have to put your hand in your face, it's important to have your hand sanitizer on you. Just quickly do that 20 second rub of all of your fingers in between your palm, the back of your palm and your wrist before you put your hand in your face. Um, it's important to have some wipes if you can. If you don't, you, it's, they're very easy to make. You know, you can get your cloth and 
have your soap and water and wipe off and dispose of that. If you're going to be touching anything, you can just take a napkin and hold on to the door instead of using your hand and then dispose of the napkin afterwards. The best thing is to stay home. That's the best practice is to stay home because once you're home, you're not exposed or you're least likely to be exposed. But if you do have to go out, it's now mandatory to put on your mask and I would encourage you to walk with your hand sanitizer. Soap and water is better than hand sanitizer. But if you can't get to soap and water, use the hand sanitizer. So again, if you're putting it on, the first thing that you want to do is use your, your hand sanitizer. Um, and when you use your hand sanitizer, you want to make sure that you get everywhere, you know, take off your jewelry, you get everywhere and, and rub in between your fingers, your thumb, you know, and around your wrist like this. And what they encourage you to do is to do it for 20 seconds and get it all in, good. And then you can put on your mask. Dr. Charles demonstrates the correct way to put on and remove a face mask. The mask typically looks like, like this and a lot of people are wearing the cloth mask. But if you, if you, the smaller part goes where your nose is and the bigger part goes where your mouth is. So this will be upside down, okay? This is the right way to do it, to put it on. And remember, my hand has been sanitized, so that's why I'm free with it. So I put it on. Now, you want to make sure, you want to make sure that both, that the strap is on. Um, there are some that comes with two straps and some people don't put on the second strap. If you have a mask that has two straps, you want to make sure that both straps are on because you want to create a seal. As you can see, you can't see underneath it at all. So you wanna make sure that the mask is secure on your face, so it's important to put on both straps. You do not want to wear your mask like this. This won't help because it now makes you vulnerable because it can go through your nose. You don't want to wear it like this either because this is not going to help you either. So if you're gonna put it on, you're gonna put on your straps. Now, before you take it off, you're gonna sanitize your hand again. You don't want to, the reason why you, the mask is to protect you from touching your face. So you, you adjust it like here. But to take it off, once you sanitize or wash your hands, you go like this to take it off. You just, you do the straps. So you try not to touch your face at all when you're taking it off, right? And that's how you do it. If, if it's dirty on the inside, you know, it's, it, then you, you throw it out. If it's wet, you, you, you throw it out. The cloth ones, we encourage you to wash them daily. You know, um, if you're using them, that, that I think the whole reason for them to be, the reason why they're cloth is so that you can wash them and you won't have to keep repurchasing the cloth ones. The N95 mask can be worn for a couple of days once it doesn't get wet and it doesn't get dirty. And the, the ones that I have here can be worn a couple of days also. They're a little bit thicker and a little bit more sturdy. And it comes in a lovely shade of pink. <laughs> Dr. Charles has words of encouragement as we go through this difficult time. Everyone should just really stay safe, stay well, and um, let's all get through this together as best as we can. What I'd want to say to, to our elderly, our elderly population, our grandparents, is if you don't have to go out, if you can have someone, a family member, a friend, a neighbor, go to the supermarket for you or go to do your bills for you or show you how to do them online, do that. Because the best thing for you right now is to stay indoors. We don't want anything to happen to you. And we don't want to put you at risk by exposing you to something that we don't even know we have because we can walk around asymptomatic and not even know it. So I'm encouraging our elderly and our senior citizens to stay home as best as possible and to stay well.